from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good afternoon and welcome to the African and Middle Eastern Division. I'm Mary Jane Deeb, Chief of the Division, and I'm delighted to see you all here for what promises to be a very exciting program. As most of you already know, uh, this division is made up of three sections, the African section, the Near East section, the Hebraic section. We're responsible for materials for more than 78 countries, in the Near East, Central Asia, the Caucasus, as well as the entire continent of Africa, uh, North and Sub-Sahara. Our Hebraic and Judaica collections come from all over the world. We also serve these materials to patrons here in our reading room and organize programs, exhibits, conferences, and other activities that highlight these collections and that inform our patrons uh, about the countries and the cultures these publications come from. The librarians in this division, as well as in a number of others, are themselves published scholars with a knowledge of the languages, the cultures of the countries for which they're responsible. Last year, we in Ahmed celebrated the birth of a new country, South Sudan. We did this with a panel of specialists in African affairs from the Library of Congress and with a representative of this new nation uh, who spoke to the unique cultural heritage of South Sudan. And today we have with us Dr. Richard Loban, Professor Emeritus of Anthropology and African Studies at Rhode Island College where he taught for 36 years and who will talk about South Sudan as well as uh, the Sudan. On a more personal uh, note, early in his career and mine, we met at the Middle East Studies Association with his lovely wife who's here with us and who's also a scholar and an expert on the Sudan. And we shared our interest in the Middle East and uh, in, uh, in the Sudan. So I'm delighted that he was able, thanks to Marita Harper, uh, our Africa Area Specialist, um, uh, who invited him here, we were able to have him today to talk to us. I would also uh, like to announce uh, that on May the 27th, we will be holding a symposium, an international symposium, on Tayeb Saleh, the famous Sudanese writer and author who has passed away, uh, but we will have, uh, we'll have a symposium on Tayyip Saleh. And then in the evening, we're going to have a program uh, in the Coolidge Auditorium of music and dance and a Sufi uh, program uh, that will be held in the evening as well. Both the symposium and the music program are open to the public, and I very much hope you will join us. And now to introduce the speaker, our own Marita Harper. Thank you, Mary Jane. And good afternoon. I am a Marita Harper, area specialist for Africa in the African section. Um, today, I will have the distinct pleasure of introducing Professor Lubin our speaker for today's lecture on Sudan of South Sudan. Dr. Luban is Professor Emeritus of Anthropology and African Studies at Rhode Island College, where he taught for 36 years. Uh, his PhD uh, is from Northwestern and in, from 1973 was on modern Sudanese Nubians. He has also taught at the University of Cartoon, Dartmouth, uh, University of Pittsburgh, 
and the American University in Cairo and conducted research in Tunis, Egypt, and Sudan. He is the executive director of the Sudan Studies Association, or which, of which he was the founding president. He worked as journalist in Africa covering wars in Sudan, Eritrea, and Guinea-Bissau, and being otherwise a supporter of the anti-apartheid and national liberation movements since first going to Africa in 1964 to build and teach in a school for refugees from Southern African races. He has published scores of articles, reviews, book chapters, translations, and encyclopedia entries. And a number of books on the Africa and Middle East he has started an archaeological project in Sudan at the Muriotic 2,000-year-old site in Sudan, where he will continue his ex excavations in December. At present, he's finishing the fourth edition of his book on Guinea-Bissau with Peter Caribe Mendy and another book on Sudan's regional security issues. He was the vice president of the Rhode Island Black Heritage Society, working on educational projects, especially including the installation of many of the plaques on the black struggles and blacks in the revolution and the Civil War. He and the uh, RIBHS, Rhode Island Black Heritage Society, <laughs> Executive Director, Bella Texiera installed a plaque at the Watchman Institute that is being discussed today. He is a proud member of NAACP, and prior to retirement, he became adjunct professor of African studies at the U.S. Naval War College. There he teaches African culture and history, African religion and politics, African economics and governance, and African security within the residential program and through the, N the U.S. Naval War College of Distant Education. I, the great pleasure, Professor Louvain. Well, with all of this generous introduction, I have hardly any time left to address this very uh, gigantic topic. And when we first spoke about the theme of uh, Sudan retrospective and prospective, I'm not sure that Marietta realizes that Africa is the birth of our species, the birth of great civilization, of writing, and so forth. And Sudanese written history is already 5,000 years. So if I have to deal with this topic in a, a few minutes, it's going to be very challenging indeed. I can say that every slide virtually is worth an entire lecture. Uh, so uh, thank you so much, Library of Congress, for inviting me. And I have to give uh, Marietta her honorary Sudan friend. And then uh, Marietta, uh, I mean, uh, Mary Deep gets a special contribution for the Library of Congress. This is the first English translation of a book by Pierre Tramo called Voyage uh, Soudan Oriental, uh, Afrique Septentrionale. And this uh, is something I translated. Thank uh, you. And you can have this forever. Uh, so the book is an tra English translation of uh, Pierre Tramo, who traveled in Sudan, did some of the first photography in Sudan. Uh, in the mid-19th century during the Turkish period. Well, with time so limited, let me speed along uh, and see what we can do. Uh, so you heard about who I, who I am. And of course, uh, since I do work for the Department of Defense, uh, these are not their ideas, it's just my ideas. Uh, Sudan was Africa's largest country, still pretty big. Uh, not so big as it used to be because the southern part, of course, has broken away in the Republic of South Sudan. 
and its uh, largest river. Southern Sudan, about the size of Texas. Uh, both uh, Texas and Southern Sudan are flat, and lots of oil, and some evangelists, uh, actually, in both places. And President Bush, who is quite popular in South Sudan, uh, uh, and President Kiir both wear cowboy hats. So we have quite a lot of things in common. Uh, the, uh, <clears throat> the map of Sudan is superimposed in this image uh, on the U.S. So you can see that northern Sudan, or Nubia, uh, basically would be in Canada, and southernmost Sudan, like Namuli, would be in the Gulf of Mexico, practically. So it's a very gigantic uh, uh, you know, country. About everything east of the Mississippi is Sudan. And remembering, of course, that Africa, to this crowd, everybody is familiar, is a continent. Hello, it's not the capital somewhere. And uh, it's more than three times the size of the continental US. Uh, Sudan's, now plural because we have two of them, have uh, diverse ecosystems, as you can see. And this adds to the complexity, both uh, ethnographic and economic complexity of the uh, nations. But one of the uh, important aspects relative to security, an area where I work, is the correlation between environment and uh, political instability. Uh, especially when we have ethnic marginalization, uh, desertification, pressure from the Sahel, uh, poor, poor or weak governance, and plentiful uh, small arms and light weapons, especially after the fall of Libya. Uh, we do have an area, as you can see in this Department of State map, uh, <clears throat> that correlates with a sort of fracture zone. The red area is a concentration of conflicts, and it's right along the Sahel, around 10 degrees or 12 degrees north of the equator. And now, as I mentioned, uh, Sudan has this immensely long history. Uh, this one slide is all that I can really allow for this history. Uh, and uh, thanks to our Egyptian uh, friend here uh, from Said in the back, um, the correlation between Egyptian history has ranged from being independent to cordial. Uh, in this particular case, for example, in the New Kingdom, uh, Egypt occupied Nubia for about 500 years. And in the hieroglyphs in the image below, it says Kush, which is a name that one can attribute to Nubia or, or Kushites, uh, the sons of Kush who represented the Egyptian pharaoh. But we also have a, another period which is less well known again, a very big specialty of mine, is Dynasty 25, <clears throat> sometimes passed off as, as Egyptians or Ethiopians, but they weren't Ethiopians nor Egyptians, they were Nubians. And uh, at least three of these Nubians have their names in the Bible. So with all due respect, I probably can't expect any of us in this room will have our names in the Bible. Uh, so we have uh, Shabaka, Shabataka, and Taharka, who's uh, image is in the middle of the picture, uh, and Pianchi, who was the founder of Dynasty 25 in the late period. So we have very complicated uh, uh, aspects. Even for Africans who have no history and they have no writing, we have to uh, put uh, the situation of Meroe, where they have a very long history and their own writing system that's never been translated until today. And there are actually more pyramids in Sudan than even in Egypt, with all due respect to Egyptians. Okay, they're younger and they're smaller, but there are more in Sudan. So we have to think about this. And as you heard in the very nice introduction, uh, the, uh, I'm actively working on an excavation for the last six years of a Meroitic temple uh, in Sudan, where there were more ruling queens uh, than there were uh, in, in most other places, and there is one uh, you can see. Also important in uh, the current conflicts and in the past conflicts is that Sudan was under Christian administration for longer than it has been Muslim. Uh, so we have our Ethiopian friends here, and uh, they are certainly well aware of the Aksumites and King Izana, who actually conquered Sudan in the fourth century. Uh, they have their own writing system, uh, Old Nubian, which is again an African writing system. And the very fascinating thing that I would like to just bring up is the Bakht or Paktum, which they had between uh, Muslim uh, Egypt and uh, Christian Nubia. 
it, it seems to be for anyone from uh, Department of State, uh, the oldest peace treaty on the planet, lasting for 700 years instead of the clash of civilizations, which we're led to believe somehow is supposed to be a natural order of things. Here are two uh, confessional kingdoms of two different faiths, Islam and Christianity, that were collaborative in one of the most important uh, uh, treaties that we can imagine. This bakht or pactum, maybe corrupted from Latin, is based on these four principles. And so perhaps uh, making a sul, to think of the Arabic word for this, perhaps we can find a new relationship between Muslim North Sudan and uh, Christian, largely South Sudan, to have a new bakht or a new sul between these faiths. In the north, of course, Islam has been deeply present since the fall of the last Christian kingdom, which was very late, not only in the Islamic world, where Islam generally spread in the seventh century, but in the whole region. Imagine Sudan is just across from the holiest centers of Islam in Mecca and Medina, and yet the last Christian kingdom in Sudan didn't fall till after Columbus came to America in 1504 with the, the sultans of the Funj. Uh, in the south, Islamism is deeply rejected. So I must make that important distinction between Islam as the faith, one of the great faiths of the Abrahamic uh, tradition, uh, but the Islamism and the political form of Islam was in fact the principal issue that divided the country uh, and now into two uh, nations. And we've had crusaders uh, in Sudan for a really long time. Uh, the Scottish fellow here on the, uh, on the left-hand side, Gordon, who was crusading for the Turks, ironically, actually, is a strange sort of thing. But anyway, uh, his politics is a strange thing. And then we had his opponent in the epic struggle, famous, made famous by Charlton Heston and Sir Laurence Olivier in the film Khartoum. And we, we have those kinds of struggles between, in, in between religion and uh, faith and politics and military still very much uh, on the agenda. Uh, General Kitchener, who later on conquered uh, South Africa, uh, came along with his Gatling guns and in one epic battle in Omdurman in September of 1898, managed uh, to lose only 35 of his forces and 10,000 Sudanese uh, in the so-called battle, but let's call it really what it is, the massacre of Kerari at that particular time. And so that's Mr. Kitchener, General Kitchener. It's critical to recognize that Sudan has extreme diversity. Uh, we have Ethiopia rep represented here, and there's plenty diverse Somalia uh, represented uh, here, and it's not diverse at all, but they can't seem to keep the state in one piece. Uh, Sudan, not surprisingly, with great diversity by religion, by economics, by language, and by ethnicity, has had a very great deal of trouble holding the state together. And when boundaries were imposed uh, by Germans and Americans and French and English and Italians and some other folks, in Berlin in, in uh, 1884 and 1885, Here's the signature list uh, uh, to attest to their uh, you know, unilateral, uh, basically, crimes against African people. They decided to divide up Africa. Uh, you know, killing Africans wasn't a big problem, but having Europeans fight over each other, so they had to have a Berlin Congress to have a truce of Europeans as they uh, pillaged the continent for their own economic, political, and national interests. Now, without going into all the history, this is much too dense. You can see on the right-hand side that the oscillation of Sudanese governance since independence in 56 has started basically with war, and it's oscillated between war and peace and war and peace and war and peace. So to the extent that most of the post-colonial history of Sudan has been at war, usually with fellow Sudanese, and has also been represented by military rather than democratic or democratically plural government. One can talk about any one of these points in Q&A uh, with time permitting. One of the important early leaders of uh, 
uh, military leaders of Sudan who had some imaginative approaches to solving the north-south problem was General Jafar Nimeri. And here you can see him in the center of the upper left-hand corner. In the below picture, you see uh, three important people now uh, all uh, passed away with Gamal Abdel Nasser on the far uh, bottom and then Jafar Nimeri and none other than Muammar Gaddafi, uh, all in the 1969-70 period when also Syed Bari came to power uh, to uh, have this great spirit of uh, Islamic and Arab uh, nationalism. It was toppled in 71 briefly as we were journalists, my wife and I uh, were journalists for the Nile Mirror at the time working for the Ministry of Southern Affairs. And uh, so we were covering, uh, here is Nimeri on the left-hand side of the picture, and in the where is Waldo, you can find my wife and me, because we were in WOW with Nimeri uh, covering uh, that uh, situation where he was introducing the second anniversary of the, uh, prin of the principle in the accord of regional autonomy. And, and this regional autonomy accord uh, signed in Addis Ababa under the administration of uh, Haile Selassie brought peace for 11 years. So it works. And Nimeri was almost a candidate for the Nobel Prize until he unilaterally abrogated that peace accord and things got worse. We have some other interesting questions here. The fellow who's bold in the middle is Rolf Steiner, a West German mercenary. And you can see my wife sitting a few rows behind uh, him there. Uh, because we covered that trial, and this was the great epic of mercenaries in Africa, whether in Biafra or Congo or Sudan, and this was uh, some important topic uh, to uh, address in terms of foreign policy. And there were certainly Cold War struggles, because we were still uh, in journal as journalists for this newspaper, uh, and when these two fellows overthrew Nimeri, uh, supporting uh, the Communist Party of Sudan, the largest, uh, one of the largest communist parties. But this coup d'etat lasted for three days, not even three weeks. And Nimeri came back to power and could introduce, uh, you know, this Addis Ababa Accord and bring the first uh, secessionist movement called Anyanya to a close at this particular uh, time. The irony is that Anyanya was trying to separate North from South, and they ended up with regional autonomy. And the second major attempt with uh, Garang, that would be Joseph uh, John Garang, uh, was any aiming for a unitary secular Sudan, and in fact he ended up uh, tragically with the separation of Sudan. Uh, but the dreams for African unity were real real dreams, but not reality. And so here is this uh, historic stamp where uh, they were all integrated, uh, the three countries, uh, Egypt and Libya and Sudan. And I think the most important reality of this was in this stamp because it never got much further than that. And it became balkanized and separated. Uh, well, I could quickly flash back with uh, the case of almost Biafra, certainly with Eritrea, and now with the ROSS, the Republic of South Sudan, uh, now all fragmented given the history of poor governance, small arms, and ethnic diversity. Uh, some other issues uh, came along uh, when the Addis Ababa Accords were abrogated unilaterally by Nimeri as he was exhausting his political uh, options. And as a consequence, the Sudan People's Liberation Army, founded by John Garang, American trained uh, military man and PhD from Iowa in economics, was formed and they began to put oil as the center part of their strategic objectives to topple the northern government. Another thing that happened is that the man on the right hand side there, Mahmoud Mohammed Taha, was considered to be Nimeri, who's a military man and sportsman, not a theologian, but he determined that Mahmoud Muhammad Taha had uh, an opposing point of view uh, relative to uh, the administration, and he was told to recant. He refused and was hanged uh, for this. 
Uh, and this somehow was the breaking point for Numeri, and he was shortly uh, afterwards himself overthrown. This was no, uh, too, too extreme. Uh, but nonetheless, the Islamism uh, versus Islam of Sudan became part of the next uh, the debate. So Numeri tried nationalism, as you've seen in some pictures. He tried communism and tried to overthrow the communists who overthrew him. He had capitalism. He was indeed in the White House with, I believe, Ronald Reagan when he was uh, uh, actually overthrown. And before that time, uh, he tried Islamism in, in, uh, in manipulating the political agenda. Finally, no more options. Goodbye, in the Mary. Let's try Mahdism again. And Mahdism, when we have the great grandson of, uh, of Muhammad Ahmed al Mahdi Muntazar, he didn't have to wait any longer. No more Muntazar, no more waiting. Uh, we can go straight to Sadiq al Mahdi, who came to power on two occasions during democratic elections. He represented a sort of slightly tolerant Islam and not necessarily Islamism, the issues about Sharia, which now spread wide throughout the Arab world, uh, were not the principal points on the agenda, but he couldn't seem to escape his inheritance and, and move towards a plural and democratic secular state. And so this became part of the ongoing problem with the SPLA. Uh, and then it got worse. Uh, we have uh, Hassan al-Tarabi, the Muslim brother, Islamic Front, architect who invited his uh, friend there just below Hassan al darabi uh, uh, Osama bin Laden, who resided in Sudan for six years. And uh, during that administration, of course, we have uh, Omar Bashir comes to power and welcoming all these people uh, for their particular missions. The Sudan at this time was essentially uh, nerve central for Islamism and the Islamist projects, a Mashru Islamiya, Mashru Khadari, as Hassan al Tarabi called it. Uh, as a veteran Sudanist uh, for 44 years now, uh, since we have gone to Sudan, I was uh, watching the situation. Here's a, not the most famous newspaper, but Providence Journal, it's a normal newspaper. And in this particular one, I wrote an article about Osama bin Laden and the World Trade Center as you can see, underlined 1998, three years before 9-11, but somehow nobody took enough interest in reading the Providence Journal. So while I was outraged at 9-11, I was not unfortunately shocked because anyone studying Sudan will know Osama bin Laden was up to a lot of mischief in those years. So the question then becomes, the eternal question within Sudan, unitary country, which is a plural and inclusive, or a divided Sudan, because there was no more room uh, what, to do, what to do. The choice was to make one attractive or not attractive, to make it a secular uh, state, a tolerant state, especially with a diversity or a sacred state. Uh, John Garang, uh, during this uh, period, as I say, American trained, uh, but working with uh, uh, various governments, uh, uh, was sent down to suppress a revolt in uh, Bor, and he decided on that occasion enough was enough, and we will move towards uh, an armed resistance against the Islamist project of the North. Unfortunately, well, fortunately, uh, this resulted in the Comprehensive Peace Accord of 2005 in neighboring Kenya, where the principles for the representatives of the principles, the SPLA and the National Congress Party, uh, signed accords which would uh, des be designed to move towards a, uh, to a new future for Sudan. Uh, there was a massive op uh, uh, optimism. Unfortunately, John Garang died tragically in a helicopter crash and was replaced by his military intelligence officer, uh, Salva Mayor Ditkir who you can see picking up the same project from literally the grave of John Garang and meeting uh, Osman Taha and, uh, and Bashir celebrating 
uh, this uh, incredible achievement you can see predicated in Sudanese history with the Bach and with Sul, uh, it was the same positive uh, spirit. Uh, unfortunately, it's not going to come out quite so well. In uh, one of my books, uh, which I have a few copies of if anybody would like to take a look later on, uh, we have basically this sort of sketch of north-south dynamics with the north being represented by military uh, leader Bashir and the South SPLA and the blue uh, line or the blue uh, oval there on the uh, right hand side represents Abye, the fracture point, the, the, the point of uh, contestation, uh, not only about the political borders but the ethnic borders between Arab and Muslim North and non-Arab uh, and, uh, uh, and sometimes Christian and pagan uh, South, but especially at Abye and nearby uh, areas like Unity Province and Bentiu, uh, we have oil. Oil in fantastically great quantities, and this has become one of the other major issues of the modern day uh, Sudan as the fault line. Uh, the GNU was the brief government of national unity when Garang and Bashir were working together, subsequently replaced by Salva Kiir and Garang. Uh, and we have other issues, of course, going on. I really just don't have time. I have whole lectures just on Darfur and just on the LRA. But these became central pieces in American domestic issues and political campaigns about how to resolve and how, who's responsible for what and what to do about Darfur. Became a very important uh, topic. And not to mention Joseph Kony and the LRA, which was used as a proxy a conflict for putting pressure by Khartoum on uh, Juba through, uh, through Kampala and through Joseph Kony. That goes on until today. Now they tried to solve that within the framework of the CPA, simple as ABC. ABC, the IBA Border uh, Commission, right in the, uh, in the middle of the lower square surrounded by red is IBA, and it represents this fracture point and it still is basically the fracture point in the current South on South violence, which prevails until today. So in case you didn't think of how a picture is worth a thousand words, here's downtown Abye, uh, highly contested by both sides. Uh, in fact, before it was so contested, the Bagara or cattle herding Arabs uh, did collaborate pretty easily with the Ngok Dinka, uh, who are cattle herding Nilotic people. They got along all right. Uh, but when uh, the exogenous forces from either Juba or Kampala or someplace else, uh, uh, they had. So we need to send in uh, joint integrated units of either AMI, African Union Mission in Sudan, or the United Nations Mission in South Sudan were sent in. Uh, to try to have force separation between these contested forces. It still leaks over, and we do have until today the Sudan Revolutionary Forces and SPLA North uh, representing southern uh, sort of interests in the north, and not to mention people like Riek Machar uh, representing northern interests or George Athor northern interests in the south. And so this issue has not gone away. It's still very much present now with the major Ethiopian, Ugandan, and now Kenyan forces uh, separating not only north from south, but especially uh, uh, southern people themselves, New Era and Dinka. So uh, Darfur, meanwhile, erupts. And again, no, this was in the context where everyone was getting enthusiastic to solve the regional autonomy issues. Uh, and uh, not to pursue that in any great length, but you can see the real upsurge uh, in 2003 of fighting in Darfur was at a time where there was intensification of the drought and trespass and conflict, inter-ethnic conflict between uh, African, like four people or other, the Daju people versus the, uh, the Janjaweed uh, of, uh, backed by Khartoum. Uh, you know, they were further inflamed. Uh, again, a topic I would love to pursue in great uh, depth because sometimes it got to be very simplified, like it was black free people versus hmm, Arab people, except in Sudan everybody is black, so that didn't work very well. Uh, 
but certainly the issues of, of climate, of governance, of ethnicity. Uh, there, everyone is Muslim, so that architecture of Christian versus Muslim also, that collapses. So the people had to configure a different sort of a way to understand this for the West uh, until they lost interest with the whole thing. Uh, and here is uh, more how it really has to do with religion and politics in Darfur. Again, not uh, having time to pursue this uh, in, at the present time. But having spoken often about Darfur, I have my Shape Up program. Uh, the first letter of each uh, topic is uh, some recommendations to shape up. Uh, and even though this was written some years ago, uh, I think the recommendations are still largely intact, not only for Darfur, but Eastern Sudan, which I can't also talk about, uh, and for South Sudan, basically shape up. Uh, we have the issue of Kony, got to be quite celebrated until this filmmaker who popularized ran around in the streets uh, naked in California, and then the people lost interest somehow. Uh, but anyway, uh, Kony was clearly backed by Khartoum, to put pressure on the SPLA, and that's a problem that still rests unresolved with attacks by the Lord's Resistance Army. Talk about using the Lord's name in vain. I think this would be about as a big extreme as you can get. Uh, Eastern Sudan, again, without uh, time to deal with this, but for Nubians, they're suffering from underdevelopment. People in Eastern Sudan, like Free Lions and Beja Congress, are suffering. Uh, in eastern Sudan, the Jalaba or core uh, elements, uh, this is the ruling element of, uh, of, uh, of Sudan. So in short, have a small break, prospective, because we, those were all retrospective, or hopefully not retrograde, just retrospective. Uh, sources of conflict typically have been of these varieties, poor governance and marginalization, military rule, uh, too many small arms and light weapons, SALW, and proxy interests to mobilize and arm different forces to put pressure on the one or the other, as well as the economic and ecological conditions. When those merge, it's a recipe for conflict. For sure, we have too many case studies. Uh, but the hope still was there in January 2011, elections for unity uh, or separation. Which road to take? to make unity attractive. The North was given this very uh, explicit, be nice to Southern people uh, because you will otherwise risk using, losing your entire country, this vast nation. But somehow they were stuck in a rut uh, in the road here and uh, could not make unity attractive. And so in 2011, when the referendum was held and only Southerners could vote, they said, you know, Kifaya, enough, I don't want to suffer from the Islamist project and from endless warfare, we're going to make a brand new Republic of South Sudan. And the, uh, the balance finally tipped. Uh, in the first uh, discussions, I had this balance beam for unity, at least equal, uh, because objectively, the North is going to lose territory. It's going, the Arab world is going to lose territory. The North will lose oil. The North will lose all sorts of things. But nonetheless, the depth of hatred and fear and distrust, as you can see, was so great that the, the balance tipped towards a separation. And Khartoum persists in its battles in other parts of the Sudan, in Darfur and Kordofan. Uh, but more war is very expensive. Uh, so uh, Chinese jets uh, can help, uh, and they're still being employed. But Sudanese people are saying, Garifna. Kifaya, uh, uh, throw over the regime. Uh, we don't want any more of this uh, m misery. But unfortunately, when they meet in Khartoum, uh, they are uh, suppressed. The SPLA now is a separate country, but even as it was becoming separate, uh, they have their own uh, uh, armor, a vast, very too big, if you would like my opinion. Uh, military force is not sufficiently disciplined, and some mini uh, air force, especially backed by Uganda. Uh, sometimes they had a little trouble getting the tanks uh, when they got hijacked in the Indian Ocean, but they finally got a good number of them, so they have their own armor. 
And uh, this new nation, as you know from reading this morning's newspapers, is having its birthing pains. Here are some ranking uh, officers from the SPLA uh, with the picture of Garang and Salva Kiir. And the reason for the American flags is this is the American consulate in Juba. I was privileged to train the first cohort at the Foreign Service Institute uh, of diplomats going there, and the uh, sense of optimism was very high. I am trying to be optimistic, but I said, look at the neighborhood and don't get too carried away. Uh, but they said, oh no, it's going to be Switzerland of Africa or something like that. Uh, is, uh, they tried to transform. There's our cowboy hat man. And uh, he tried to be inclusive, depending upon how one stands on this. Uh, but was the transformation of a guerrilla movement to a state uh, going fast enough and well enough? Well, uh, these folks here, especially Salva Kiir, is of Dinka ethnicity and Riek Machar, formerly rebel even against the SPLA in previous reincarnations, said not even close. And in December, uh, uh, this past December, I was in Sudan actually as this unfolded, he said not enough. And one can debate who started what and when and which, which objective. Uh, that's a good debate to have. Uh, but now there is armed struggle, very bloody armed struggle, with half a million refugees streaming to Uganda, to Kenya, to Ethiopia, and other places, even to the north, where they're just left to come back to their new republic. So we have that situation. Um, now, in this uh, diagram, uh, I have a grant from the Office of Naval Research to study social networks in Sudan. It's too complicated to explain it all to you here, but you can see that in the top center is Salva Kiir, the president of South Sudan, and off on to the left-hand side you see uh, Riek Machar. He literally was marginalized. Okay, he was vice president, but he was frustrated in the marginalization. The software is very powerful and can manipulate the, the data, all open source, I'm not a spy or anything here, uh, all open source uh, data uh, on 4,000 data points over a 10 year period. So if anybody's interested in discussing this type of uh, political net social network mapping, I would be so glad. Uh, so we've looked at the recipe for conflict. And so here is the recipe for peace. And we have had some heroic, important examples of having peace between conflicting parties in Sudan. You have mutual respect, mutual trust, mutual interest. It's kind of like a recipe for a good marriage, right? Uh, it does, it's not a secret what, what will work. And it's also not a secret when you fail in doing these things. We've had these cases of, of sulh or salam. And we had the cases of mediation, regional autonomy, and adjudication, and forced separation. They work. It's not the secret. But you have to have mutual respect and trust and goodwill uh, for this to work. So now, here we are. Today, literally today, I've already read the news from South Sudan, very grim news. Uh, we have uh, major fighting over personalities, over oil, over ethnicity, over religion to some extent, over proxy forces. All of these, uh, this uh, list, uh, that it should be underscored that there is not a single factor. I know the press likes to say uh, tribalism in Africa. I, I fundamentally reject that. Not to say that it's not a factor, because it is a factor, but to say that it's the exclusive factor absolutely overlooks a great deal of depth and complexity. And if you don't understand the situation, just Keep your nose out of it or don't try to analyze it on some simplistic reductionistic model because you will fail. Uh, it is a rough neighborhood. Uh, look at CAR, look at Uganda, not so democratic. Ethiopia is doing okay. Kenya has got a few issues like terrorism. Uh, North Sudan, uh, we have already this functional uh, area. And so why should we expect that South Sudan will be born into this wonderful uh, new world? especially when oil is there in great supply. Uh, so uh, oil goes mostly from the south, 80% or so, 75%, right by my archaeological site, by the way, so I'm real familiar with oil going by. Um, it goes underground, so I can't use it for our vehicles or anything. Um, 
And we have another complexity. Uh, we have, of course, some aspects of the Arab world, uh, which is in, of course, current uh, great disarray in the post-Arab spring, now the Arab summer or even the Arab fall or winter even has come. Uh, but China is the big player, and Iran as well, in the Sudan. Uh, China and, uh, and Iran have a somehow pariah status, and since Sudan also has a pariah status, they make a nice relationship. And uh, uh, China is keen to get oil for its uh, burgeoning economy and keen to trade oil for arms, and so we have that aspect uh, as well. As long as countries in Africa and the Middle East are willing to say that Taiwan doesn't exist, China will smile uh, uh, on, upon them. So that's another factor, uh, you know, Chinese arms for oil. And Chinese peacekeepers. Uh, Chinese peacekeepers are actually uh, deployed in many countries of conflict. We don't even have, have an awareness about that because Americans do transport peacekeepers, but Americans will not go under somebody else's flag. So we have no peacekeepers, really. Uh, and China and Africa, they have quite a few of those. And here is Bashir and the former head of state of, uh, head of government of China. Uh, Chinese do even suffer casualties when attacked by rebels in South Kordofan. Those are three deceased Chinese uh, peacekeepers. So they have uh, paid uh, serious uh, prices in human terms. So uh, in addition to all these complexities, as they say, each slide is worth a lecture, we have the economic struggles, especially now prominent in North Sudan because the oil has been cut tremendously. They have tried to have a mini gold rush, a mini phosphorus fertilizer rush, but the North is very much uh, subverted economically uh, by high inflation. And so we have class issues, we have brain drain issues. Again, I can't deal with all of these except more in the Q&A afterwards. So uh, here we are, two uh, countries uh, with their 10 states of the Republic of South Sudan born on uh, July 2011 and going uh, still fighting over uh, over oil. Here is Ben Tiu, quite near to Abye, uh, Hegleg Ben Tiu, and fighting was very intense in January there, and fighting is still very intense this morning, looking at this morning's news in parts of Malakal. Bor seems to be a little bit quieter, and Juba is more or less slightly getting back a little bit to uh, normal. But this is exactly that same borderline between these two zones of ethnicity, religion, economic conflict, and different models of governance. So if uh, drawing again from my book, here is the sort of summary uh, of the book and the summary of the situation in Sudan. Anybody thinking it's simple will be much mistaken. Uh, any one of these intersecting Venn diagrams can be dissected by personalities, by uh, any other which way. As I say, I have a couple of copies of my book, uh, and it will examine chapter by chapter each one of these particular conflict zones where I analyze them by social network analysis, by historical analysis, by resource analysis, and, uh, and you, can, you can pick your favorite uh, topic, but certainly we're dealing with uh, a neighborhood that is one of the most fragile, the most filled with refugees, the most disturbed, the most strategically valuable, even though we have the not adequate resources, neither political nor military nor otherwise or diplomatic to deal with these issues. So I tried to summarize using one of my uh, organizational risk analysis diagrams, and at the heart of this I put weaponry. And you can see that weaponry without, I mean, if people are using traditional weapons, it's going to be a lot less lethal, uh, but with uh, high-tech weapons, you can see that uh, all of the conflicting parties are it locked into extremely bloody uh, conflicts. So uh, what do we do? Uh, people ask me, what do I do? Well, first of all, realize the complexity. Realize the length of history. You don't do that, you're never going to you'll come up with, say, well, let's do, let's go and kill this guy or shoot that guy or put sanctions here or do that. 
a very simplistic. Uh, again, the simplest way to uh, address this is for you to take a moment to survey these 10 points uh, uh, and uh, try to be upbeat, try to be realistic about what can be done, what should be done, what might be done. Uh, the bottom one, I think, maybe is the most important, uh, keep people talking. So even though this morning's news had fighting still going on in between northern and southern Malakal, talking is still going on in Addis Ababa. Uh, I can't just guarantee who is going to uh, win or lose or how it's going to unfold. I don't have a telescope into the future. But I know that talking is better than shooting uh, because you're going to have less refugees and less destabilization and less fragility of institutions. So we are really at the horns of a dilemma. Uh, I think the street sign from Juba says it all. If you can't understand it in English, it's in Arabic. Armed conflict is a health risk. I think probably everybody will agree. I was admonished not to have uh, too much politics. I hope I not too much politics, but I think that's a pretty non-political statement. It's not serving anybody's interests in the global community, the regional community. Africa as a continent's got too much conflict. Let's try to get off of these horns of a dilemma. Another option, commercial message, join the Sudan Studies Association. We've been doing this for 33 years or so. Uh, and uh, there's our website. You can come to our meeting if you are seriously engaged in this. Uh, and actually, you can read my books uh, on Sudan security. I did uh, have the privilege of working for the Air Force doing this manual expeditionary guide for Sudan and South Sudan, and also privileged to make the do not bomb list. So I hope uh, that happens. And here is my latest book comes out in April on Libya, uh, which uh, also relates to this region. And then some of the other books uh, that my wife and I have written. I do work in archaeology, uh, so that's available. Our historical dictionary of Sudan, uh, I suppose this illustrious uh, library will have a copy, the fourth edition, not the earlier one. And this is the first uh, re revelation of the road to two Sudans. This will come out around uh, mm, April or so, uh, a collected work from our Sudan studies. And I do also deal, uh, since I have two daughters and strong mother and lovely wife, well, I do deal with women's issues. So this is a book on Middle Eastern women in the invisible economy. So that's my commercial message. I hope I didn't exhaust your interest or patience. And I've been speedy. Uh, but anyway, now it's your turn to uh, uh, say something about uh, issues that I've raised. Yeah. Okay. Uh, question is, how much is China controlling in the oil production? Uh, yeah. Uh, the answer fluctuates, uh, not because I'm being uh, elusive, but because the oil has been from a sing single pipeline, which was quite full, three to five hundred uh, thousand barrels a day, uh, and then sometimes two pipelines also having mostly full. Uh, and nowadays, the production has gone very far, very low. So the fluctuation uh, of the amount of oil pumped from the south uh, to the north, from upper, upper Blue Nile as well as Heglig and Bentiu, is uh, very fluctuating given the conflict. And the conflict is very much about who's going to control or, or upset uh, you know, the flow of oil. 
Uh, China, I would say, is around about a third of that oil. It goes to other uh, countries. Uh, Petronas from Malaysia is the other major. India is there, but not as uh, quite a big deal. Needless to say, the Arab world that has oil rich doesn't take any oil because they don't need it. Uh, so chi China has the most dynamic economy, maybe growing if things have been good already consistently for China, five to seven percent per annum, and about five to seven percent of the oil f that China uh, gets is from Sudan. So you could say it's the margin of keeping the dynamic Chinese economy going. Uh, so those are the ways you would uh, kind of try to analyze. It's not the only player. And now uh, with the separation, there's already been Chinese and Japanese interest in making a new pipeline from the same oil fields, but to go out through the southeastern part of the uh, of Republic of South Sudan down through Kenya, Karamajong area, and then down to Lamu. So that didn't happen, uh, mostly because uh, now there's a new conflict. So that project was very much underway, also to make a refinery in the south, which they didn't have. The refineries were all in the north, where the oil wasn't, and the pipelines were. So it's a very much contested uh, uh, aspect. Maybe one other quick comment is that China and Angola, China and Nigeria, of course, are making up for some of the shortfall which they had gotten in Sudan, but those oil supplies were less valuable because the quality of oil may be less good than Ch Sudanese, and the distance back to China was also greater for West Africa. So just a few thoughts. Yeah, South Sudanese how, how much are they actually Maybe 70 percent, or yeah, maybe more. Uh, the only oil, a little bit of oil in the Red Sea, not much, and a little bit of oil in South Darfur, uh, but not so much. So the, the vast majority of oil is definitely from the South, and the exploration of the South is still uh, not complete. Yes. No, but I mean, how much do they earn from the production? Well, right now, practically uh, nothing, yes. because th that's where they both shot themselves in the foot. And, and they both desperately need uh, revenue to run the wars and conflicts because even there is south-on-south -south conflict which needs money and there's north-on-north -north conflict which needs money. Right at this moment, there's not too much north and south conflict. In fact, there have been some collaboration, ironically, between Bashir and Salva Kiir because they both need oil. And uh, ironically, although Khartoum had supported Riek Machar in the past, it's not in their interest to support him now uh, because uh, he's damaging the oil supply. A very complicated issue. Yes? Are there still uh, cross-cutting entities like churches or right. merchant associations or anything else that can be used to achieve a kind of peaceful mediation and resolution? You are part of that trying to Right. Well, I could be very simple and say yes. <laughs> Uh, but uh, it, it entitles a much more of an answer. Uh, the, the, the irony which did come out of the presentation is that there is no secret how to get peace and how to maintain peace, how to have separation of forces. The African Union is now painfully aware of the techniques that are available for negotiation, force separation, uh, mediation, uh, you know, all different reparation and all different kind of things that, they, that can be done. Uh, so it's not a secret. On the more focused part of your question about civil society agencies, they are active. They're just not active enough. They're not empowered enough. There are many civil society uh, groups, for example, fighting corruption, for women's rights, for freedom of, uh, uh, you know, for delivery of health services. It can be the local ones. It can be international ones, doctors with uh, borders. It can be so many uh, agencies that can be, should be, are active as best as they can be, but clearly as we're into a, uh, you know, like this military jargon phase two conflict where everything is like violently being resolved, they, they, they're, they're marginalized in the, in the conflict. Uh, luckily, even uh, literally this morning, there's fighting going and talking going on. If we can shift the equilibrium to talking and less for fighting, then we have uh, you know, optimism. 
the war will come to an end because that's what happens to wars. They come to an end. How much casualty, human loss, uh, life uh, loss of property it remains to be seen. I am all for empowering the international agencies, the African Union, the Arab League to whatever extent it even can exist uh, anymore. Uh, you know, the, the, they are playing a role, uh, mobilizing the, uh, the logistics, the African Command, the African Combatant Command of our new Department of Defense is doing a, a lot to move those forces around, to bring them into, uh, into uh, application and deployment. So things are going on. Uh, I, I should say I'm optimistic that this high level of fighting will finally dissipate. But until the causes of it, which you've seen are multifaceted, are really addressed and civil society uh, can trump uh, the militarists on all different sides, then it will, it will recur, uh, I would predict. But this is part of the weakness of civil societies. Yes, please. I understand. I'm really trying to get this one up because the next thing you show, there were tanks and jets. The tanks and jets were not made or built or designed in Sudan. They come from where else? The European countries. Um, to keep confusion going so that the people would not go together. Right. That's the problem. That Well, certainly education is a fundamental necessity, uh, but education by for whom and by what and which curriculum, that's uh, big because they have plenty of education in Sudan. There's universities all over the place, but for free open discourse, it's a little bit on the short side. But as for Ch China is not building too much in the world of schools, uh, they're, or even there's some, but not so much. Right. That, that's certainly uh, true. And you have a parochial interests. Then they, I mean, the current conflict in Sudan is very parochial uh, of South Sudan. So anyway, thank you very much. Maybe next question. Right. Yeah. Uh, in Juba and in Malakal reports for the last uh, few days is that some of the rebel forces have gone into the hospital in Malakal and just executed people in their hospital beds. So this is a, I mean, about as extreme uh, wrong thing to do as you can get. Right. Yeah, I think we have, uh, bo both have failed. From the grassroots, people are interested in their cattle and you know, their family protection or revenge or very you know, sad, sad uh, low-level motivations. Uh, and at the highest level, uh, with corruption and abuse of power and then little control of, uh, of, of small, small, small arms. I mean, the average person in Sudan will have a clash the cough. And that's not going to actually do a lot of positive good, I don't think. Uh, so it's a failure on both sides. Uh, maybe in retrospect, going slower, being less enthusiastic, less rosily optimistic, 
uh, might have made people more realistic, more monitoring, more empowerment of civil society. Uh, you know, but right now we just deal with the situation as it is, and the first thing we have as the top priority is getting the you know forced separation. And, and so people stop killing, and then you can slow down the refugees and, you know, turn, uh, you know, dear foreign aid to uh, positive good rather than just reparations of, you know, wounded bodies and wounded infrastructure. Yes, please. Right. I think they're not. They're completely uh, moved out of northern Uganda. Uh, the Acholi people are gone there. I mean, they're there, they're, but the LRA supporters are gone. And, um, uh, and I haven't heard of a single attack in Namuli or Western Equatoria. Uh, so it's mostly in the Garamba forest of DRC and in easternmost uh, parrot speak of CAR. But since CAR is in the state of civil war, uh, I don't know if this will, you know, increase the chance that Kony gets, uh, you know, removed from the battlefield, or it will give him more space. Uh, sometimes you hear that some he goes for vacation up to Darfur, or I don't know where he's going. Uh, if I knew, I would. I know the right people to tell where he is, and I could make recommendations about how they could proceed. But. That's another topic. Much more interesting than I thought it would be. Can you Oof. <laughs> <laughs> it's like another boring lecture about Africa. <laughs> what, how, how does it have any relationship to anything? So my question is, can you recommend any online classes or any universities that have particularly good courses about Oh, yeah. Science? Naval War College, College of Distance Education. Uh, become our student. But I mean, uh, and join Sudan Studies Association. This is a real typical for Sudan Studies Association because we, we never start a meeting. The Nile is in Sudan and it's very long and it's got the desert. We go, Shh. so I did, knew, knowing my time was limited, I, I didn't uh, slow down at all. Then keeps you in, keeps you engaged. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.